Hi there, this is Professor Juris, and I just wanted to make you a quick video and uh, show you how to make a palladium print. And whether this is uh, your first palladium print or you're an experienced palladium printer, um, there might be something here to help you uh, learn something um, if you're an experienced palladium printer. But um, this is your first try. I'm going to make this video step by step and um, make it pretty simple so you can um, have success on your first time printing. So what I wanted to start with um, first is selecting a palladium printing kit. And if you're just getting started in um, palladium and making palladium and platinum prints, the best way to do it is simply to buy a kit that's been put together. And I highly recommend this, these kits from Bostick and Sullivan. Uh, they're in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, great kits, and there's probably nobody um, in the world, I don't think, that knows as much about platinum and palladium printing as they do. I ordered my first chemicals from them back in, uh, I would say, like 1982, and um, dealing with Richard Sullivan, and um, the kits are just phenomenal, and they've really progressed as far as um, all the things that are available and how simple they are to use now. Back when I, I started, um, Bostick and Sullivan was just getting started too, I think, and um, a lot of the stuff I had to mix myself and, um, you know, put things together, but... Um, now it's so simple, so I highly recommend just getting your kit from them. And you always know you're getting good quality, uh, fresh chemicals. There's a lot of other suppliers out there that may have some of these things that um, they may not be fresh or they may not work as well. So I would just stick with Bostick and Sullivan. They, they produce really good kits. So let's look at the, the Zia type printing kit and tell you about what it is. The Zia type printing kit is a, a very, um, very similar to um, the printing out papers it is a printing out process so in other words if you're printing with this the whole image will be um, developed by the sun or by your exposure light and um, so it's it's basically the whole image is printed up when you do it um, I haven't tried this kit yet but I'm going to uh, try it in the future the kit I mostly use is this classic palladium printing kit and I'll, I'll tell you why I like to have the classic palladium printing kit because I do both digital negatives and traditional film negatives. So negatives that have been developed, um, silver, silver negatives, gel silver. Um, and the classic uh, palladium printing kit will print both. So you can do both with it. And um, we'll talk a little bit about the developers and stuff here in a little bit. But um, it comes with um, potassium oxalate developer, which is a... A classic uh, developer so it gives me classic tones with this it looks like um, prints that were made in the 19th century when you produce with that um, very good kit and again you can use this kit for um, both negatives and you can use it uh, for for digital stuff at least I do and it works it seems to work really good now they have a kit that's um, actually made for um, the traditional play let's see where it is the the NA2 Palladium kit is down here in the corner. And this kit is um, simply made for um, printing digital negatives um, with palladium. And then they have a platinum and palladium kit, which is if you want to start trying to add some platinum to, to it. So th there's a whole versatile amount of kits here. And then they have the back to school special, which um, you can get 100 mils of palladium and 100 mils of ferric oxalate to start. And that'll really get you off and running if you want to... Um, you know, start to really get into this, but um, you may, if you're doing it for the first time, you maybe just want to start with a um, the traditional um, kit right here, or the um, kit right here for just doing uh, palladium combination. Or this is platinum palladium too, made with um, digital negative. So, so that's a look at their kits um, that you can get, and uh, they'll they'll really take good care of you if you um, get a kit from them. Now, I just want to talk a minute, too, about the uh, sensitizer that comes with the kit. Um, you will get ferric oxalate number one and ferric oxalate number two when you purchase a kit. And the ferric oxalate um, is actually the sensitizer that will make your metal salts, your platinum or your palladium or both, uh, become light sensitive by mixing it with this. And the difference, basically, in the two is um, that... Um, the ferric oxalate number one is just a straight solution of ferric oxalate. The ferric oxalate number two has um, potassium chlor chlorinate in it. 
And what the potassium chlorinate does is um, it actually will add contrast to the print. So that's actually labeled ferric oxalate number two uh, when you look at this. So you'll be getting three bottles of solution um, with, your, with your kit or possibly four if you get the digital negative kit. But with the, with the basic classic kit comes with is a, a bottle of palladium salts um, mixed, in, you know, mixed into solution. It'll come with ferric oxalate number one. It'll come with ferric oxalate number two. And for the most part, you'll be using mostly ferric oxalate number one. Um, unless you have a really low contrast negative or something, then you would be adding more ferric oxalate number two, which actually adds contrast. Now, the ferric oxalate number two also um, will lengthen your exposure time. So you need to be um, a little bit careful about how much ferric oxalate number two you're using, but usually it's just a minimal amount, especially if you um, developed your negatives correctly, if you're using film negatives, um, or if you made your digital negatives correctly and you made them with a little bit of punch, a little bit of contrast in them, you know, raising the contrast, um, you'll get a good print just um, using ferric oxalate number one. Now, as far as the um, mixture goes, and we're going to look at the, the droplet chart here in a minute, or the drop chart, but basically what you're doing is you're taking the same amount of palladium salts, or the same amount of palladium solution, and you're mixing that with an equal amount of ferric oxalate. Now, it doesn't matter if it's all ferric oxalate number one, um, or if it's a combination of ferric oxalate number one and two, does ferric oxalate, if you mix number one and two together, they still have to equal the amount of drops that you have for palladium. So if you have a 16 drops of palladium in your beaker, you need to add 16 drops of um, ferric oxalate. So it could be 14 drops of ferric oxalate number one, um, and then two drops of ferric oxalate number two to come up with the 16 drops. Um, but it's an equal amount of the ferric oxalates combined and, e and the equal amount of the um, palladium solution or the platinum solution, depending on what you're using. And if you're using a combination of platinum and palladium, again, those are going to be equal amounts when they're put together, um, at equal to the amount of ferric oxalate that you're adding to the solution. And you're basically just measuring this by drops. And when you're measuring it by drops into a glass container, again, you never want to use metal for this, but it'll go into a glass or a plastic container. Um, when you're putting your drops in and um, just counting them out. Now, one thing that I've found is that um, buying this from, from other places, I, I've never actually bought it myself from other places. I buy it all from Bostick and Sullivan. But um, buying, I've heard from other people that are printing, and so I've had students that have bought it from other places that... Um, their prints were coming out really flat and gray and everything, and I, I let them try some of my Bostick and Sullivan ferric oxalate, and it totally turned the print around. So this stuff does go bad. Um, they have a one to two year shelf life on theirs. Um, depends on how it was stored. If it was stored in a you know a cool environment that's um, you know dark, it'll it'll store longer. But if you put it out in like in the heat somewhere or something, it's not going to store as long. So. Um, and you can also, one of the nice things about um, Bostick and Sullivan is you can buy this in dry packs. Um, in other words, they will have the um, powder in here that you mix with water, and then you would get your, and that extends the life expectancy. So say you wanted to buy four of these or something, and you're going to use them throughout the year. Um, you can just mix them up as you need them, and then it'll last a lot longer and be fresher when you mix it. So I really like buying the, the uh, dry packs of the ferric oxalate. And here's a quick look at the uh, different developers that they carry. And again, I don't think you can find all these different developers, um, you know, anywhere else. There, there's some tremendous developers here. And with the uh, classic palladium kit, you get the pot potassium oxalate developer, um, which again is a developer that was used during the 19th century. So if you want your prints to really have that historical look to them and um, a really nice warm tone that this is a gorgeous developer and it comes with the kit but you can also order these developers separately if you want to try you know try some different developers um, the citrate developers were always considered to be a little less poisonous but again remember they're only a little less poisonous until they're used once they're used they get the metal salts in them and they're you know even more poisonous so they're, they're all poisonous just don't um 
you know, get them on your hands or, you know, mess with them. You want to wear gloves and stuff when you're doing this. But the developer I like the best, I think, is this cold bath developer. Um, it really produces a warm, rich print. And it depends on the temperature that you're using it at. Sometimes if I'm going to print like I know I'm going to make a print in like a half hour or something, I'll actually stick the bottle in the freezer. And um, I don't want it to freeze, but I just want it to get really cold before I pour it on the print. And um, it just really produces some dark, rich, warm tones. Um, so this is a developer to try if you haven't tried this developer. And then I just wanted to take a quick look at um, the uh, clearing agents um, that are available. And the one that comes with the kit is the uh, Tetrasodium, also known as uh, EDTA. And this is actually just, um, you could probably buy this in a hardware store. It's actually um, just a high-powered cleaning agent. And um, I remember stripping wood um, in an old house long ago, and we actually used this EDTA after we had stripped the wood to clean all the um, the residue and stuff from the, the cleaners and stuff off of the wood. And But it's used as a very diluted bath all the time when you use it like that. People use this for everything. Some people mix this with, um, you know, water in a sprayer bottle and use this to clean their shower. So it's just a high-powered cleaning agent. Um, but it's what comes with the kit, and it, it works really well for the most part. Um, I, I've used it successfully to clear a lot of prints, and it's it's probably the easiest to, to use. Now, there's two things about the EDTA that I want to point out that you need to be really aware of. Um, the first, and this are safety concerns. So the first one is um, with this powder when you're mixing it. It's it's very it's a very fine powder, and it doesn't matter if you're mixing this for um, for use with palladium printing or you're using it as a cleaner. Um, it's a, it's a very fine powder, um, and it it tends to pick up or float in the air when you're using it. So it it becomes like a dust molecule. So again. When you're using this, I like to just mix mine into solution outside, and I also wear a dust mask to make sure that I'm not breathing any of this in. Um, <clears throat> I have used it um, around, like in my early days, without a mask, and I remember coughing afterwards um, because it's such a fine particle, and you can actually breathe it in. So please wear a mask when you're mixing this. And then the second um, health concern about this is that it will dry your skin out. Um, Again, back in the day when I was doing this, um, yeah, I didn't really wear gloves or, you know, use tongs when I was picking up my prints. And I would simply stick my fingers to, to transfer the print from one tray to the other. And this will really take, it's a cleaning agent. It's really going to take all the oils off of your skin. So I was printing so much back in the day that um, my skin actually, my hand, the skin on my hands actually dried out and, you know, began to crack. It almost looked like I had psoriasis. So, um, you know, again, we're safety concerns have come a long way too with any um, photographic chemicals and darkroom procedures so please wear a um, you know wear a mask when you're mixing this and wear gloves and use tongs when you're picking the prints up out of this because otherwise you're just going to dry your skin out and then you're going to um, you know have to go get some um, lotion to keep on your hands all the time uh, to try to you know heal them but this you know will take the the oils out of your skin Now, I haven't tried this sodium bisulfate clearing agent yet, but I'm getting ready to order some. Um, the print that I'm using in this video, I actually had a little bit of trouble clearing it because I, I put a really thick solution of palladium down on the paper. And um, it took me three baths. And normally, it'll take you two baths um, when clearing a print, and I'll talk about that when we get to the clearing of print. But um, this bath is, um, this solution, the sodium bisulfite is... It's a 50-50 mixture of sodium bisulfate and EDTA together, and um, it'll help clear prints that are stubborn. So I want to, you know, give that a try. But it, um, it's a, it should be a really good clearing bath to have, and especially if you're using the potassium oxalate developer, which is in the classic um, palladium printing kit. And a lot of people use um, use this citric acid clearing agent. Um, it again will tickle your nose if you um, when you mix this with water. If you don't have a dust mask on, it is um, you know just a very strong solution of citric acid, and I'm sure it will dry your skin out too. So um, you know be careful with this as you as you would other ones. And then also do not mix this with sodium sulfite, as it um, 
it may release sulfur gas and you know you don't want to deal with sulfur gas so um, you know all these chemicals that we're, we're talking about in here whether it be the developers or the clearing agents um, or the ferric oxalate you just want to make sure that you take precautions um, for your health so please be careful with all this stuff and again um, you know, I've said this in my safety video if you haven't watched that, but um, if you have little children at home, um, you know, take precautions like lock your stuff up. Don't leave this laying around. Like I mentioned that um, I keep my cold bath solution. I put that in the fridge, my cold bath developer solution. I would never do that if I had children around. Because if it's in the fridge and it's in a bottle, it's something to drink. And, you know, you might be off in another room and a, a kid will go in there and see something in the fridge and take it out of there and drink it. So, um, you know, don't, don't do any of these things if you have children around. Um, you know, keep this stuff locked up. Be safe. So I touched a little bit on this um, when I was talking about the ferric oxalate, but I just wanted to show you the... Um, the print drop chart right here and with the print drop print drop chart what you're doing is you're actually counting out the drops you need to make a finished print so say if you were making a four by five print you would take six drops of palladium um, and this is a starting point again you can adjust the amount of ferric oxalate um, number two that you're adding and, and you know you could put like three three drops to two drops uh, three drops to three drops so that you have um, six but these these two ferric oxalate number one and ferric oxalate number two should always equal the amount of drops that you're using for palladium is the thing right here and this is kind of a, a start and it, it kind of actually might differ a little bit depending on the paper you're using some papers are more absorbent than others so some papers will take more solution um, when you're pouring the solution on and absorb it faster and others may, may puddle up a little bit. Um, you may have mixed a little bit too much when you're, you're doing this, but either way you can, um, you know, get by with it. Um, and, but just kind of use this as a reference point to start. So with my print, um, it's actually a 12 by 12 inch image. So I'm actually, um, making a double batch of the eight by 10, whereas, um, I'm going to add 40 drops of um, palladium number uh, three. I'm going to add um, 36 drops of ferric oxalate number one. And I'm going to add four drops of um, ferric oxalate number two. Um, th th so the 36 and four makes um, 40, which would be the same as that my palladium number three when making the print. And you're simply mixing these in a glass container. I have a little glass bowl and a little small glass beaker. And what I will do is generally um, I'll pour some of the, I'll make enough, and again, I have a 12 by 12 inch image, so this is going to be more than what I need. But what I'm going to actually do is make a test print. Um, and because I'm making such a large image, I don't want to just coat this up with, you know, 40 drops of palladium and then find out the print was too light or too dark and, you know, have to throw that away and waste all that. So I'm making up a little bit more than what I need for, per print. And then I will do a couple tests. I have enough in there to do probably three tests, four tests um, extra than what I will need to coat the print. And what I'll do is mix this up in a bowl and then I pour it in a beaker. Or I could mix it in a beaker and pour some in the bowl um, just to pour out onto the piece of paper that um, I'm actually using for my test. Probably going from the beaker to the bowl would be better. But um, And then I will coat my, coat my paper with my hake brush and um, just make a small test first with maybe you know, about maybe a half of a teaspoon or something, a little less than a quarter of a teaspoon of solution, just enough to get the brush wet and uh, wipe it around. And let's take a look at my test that I made. So as you can see, um, I didn't really coat like a whole sheet of paper. I just put a few drops. You could actually use your beaker dropper and just pull out like a dropper full um, and squirt it on your paper and then brush that on to make your test. And because I'm making the test from the same solution, the same mixture that I actually um, made for the print, it's going to come out identical. Whereas you can go back in and try to remix it, but sometimes when you're, you're, when you're working with the droppers, you'll notice this. If, when you're counting your drops, you have to be very careful, and sometimes two drops will come out at once when you're you know, squeezing the rubber top of it. So you have to really count carefully. But by making enough um, at one time to just do your one print, you know, I'm not making, I'm not mixing it all together. I'm going to point that out. I'm just mixing enough to make one print and a couple tests. So a little bit more than what's required to make your uh, full-size picture. 
and then I went ahead and made this test and um, this was too light so I went back in and did another test and um, and after the other test I came up with my final printing time that I'm going to make the print at so let's take a look at that now this is just a um, quick picture a quick image of my print station um, ready to make my final print and you can see I have my palladium solution, um, my ferric oxalate number one, and then my ferric oxalate number two over here. And I put the palladium printing um, god in here so that um, he blocks the two so I don't mistakenly put too much uh, ferric oxalate number two in there. Um, or I could, if I was doing uh, the NA2 process, I could put my bottle of platinum right in there. So I'd have my palladium, platinum, and ferric oxalate mixtures in there. And this is real nice, real simple to make. You just get a 2x4 and um, drill the holes in that are the size of the bottle. And then you can put your bottles in it. You can sand it down a little bit, stain it, and have a nice handy holder. And this will also help your bottles from falling over when you're using them. So I have my paper down here. And it's important, again, that you have a hard surface. So I have a piece of black um, gator board down underneath the paper that I'm going to coat. So, And this also once this keeps the stuff off the counter so you don't have to clean a lot. And after this gets, after you've done a lot of prints on this, you could simply dispose of the gator board um, and, you know, just get a new piece. And you could just use foam core, too. I just happen to have some gator board, so that's what I'm using. But this, this works really good. I have my hake brush over here. Now, in between every use, especially with plat platinum and palladium, you need to really make sure that you clean out your brush. So even after I did the test, I washed the brush out. I don't just set the brush down after the test and um, use it to coat the print because then the chemicals will be contaminated. Uh, the metal salts in, in there will um, oxidize very quickly and that'll add oxidized metal salts to the um, metal salts, that, the fresh metal salts that you're mixing. And again, a glass bowl, no metal, no metal on the brush. Um, you can use those, um, foam those foam brushes like you get at Lowe's. Again, I prefer the ones that have a round handle and a very tight foam structure. You don't want to use uh, cheap ones like you get at the dollar store that um, have, you know, almost like Brillo pad looking foam on them. Those don't coat very well, but the ones that have a very dense closed cell foam work very nicely. You could also use a puddle pusher if you wanted to try that. And a puddle pusher is simply a glass rod that when you pour the chemicals down onto the paper, you simply run this glass rod back and forth and, you know, move the chemicals around with it. But I prefer a hake brush. I've been using them for 40 years, so... Um, you know, it's, it's a good brush to, to start with. And you want to have the brush also, so you're only using this for your um, pl platinum and palladium chemicals. You don't want to use the same brush for your Van Dyke browns. You don't want to use the same brush for your cyanotypes or for your gum solution. You should have a, a different brush for each one. And you can see over here, you can't really see the top of them, but I have a, a jar right here that I keep my brushes in after I wash them out. And then I have each brush labeled too, so that I can tell what, what that brush is for, if it's a gum printing brush or, and basically a brush will last you quite a while. Um, you won't have to keep replacing them all the time if you wash them out really good after each use. So we're ready to go go in right now. I have my piece of paper down here. I've drawn out, I laid my negative down and I drew out the lines with a pencil. Only use pencil, don't use ink, pen, marker, or blood. Um, just pencil only when you're doing this. And, um, you know, do a tracing and this will give you an idea where you're going to be coding at when I'm making this when I'm making this print. So let's take a look at uh, the coding process. Okay, we have our testing all done and um, what we're going to do now is coat the final print and this is actually a 12 by 12 inch um, print that I made a digital negative from or for and um, so what I have here is I mixed a double um, a double eight by 10 batch of the uh, solution. And when I mixed that, what I did is I, it's mixed by drops and I followed the um, simple instruction sheet that comes with the palladium printing kit. And I'm using the classic palladium printing kit to make this print. Um, so what I'm gonna do right now is um, I have the solution ready right here. So I'm just gonna pour the solution on top of the paper right here. And then I'm gonna proceed to brush this on. And I want to cover the whole piece of paper. And I don't want to brush it too fast because um, if I brush it too fast, I can get it to roll off of the paper here. But I have you'll notice I have this paper on a piece of um, black gator board also, so it's a good firm surface. Um, 
And what I'm just going to do, and I see I got a hair right here, I want to make sure I get that hair out of there. So I have a little paper towel that I'm wiping this with. And you just want to let this soak in as you're brushing it on. Okay, so when your print is um, drying or your palladium mixture is drying, it's a good time to grab a quick sandwich. So I'm going to recommend this um, pepper, pepper and egg sandwich, which was a staple of the uh, steel workers in Youngstown. After you eat, you can go back in and um, check your piece of paper, and it should look like this. This is what the uh, finished sheet of um, palladium paper looks like after it's been coated. You can see there's um, no more puddles on it and, and it dried very nicely. So at this point, what you might want to do is actually um, get your hair dryer and blow this for maybe one or two minutes just with cool air and make sure that the surface is totally dry. And the reason you want to make sure that the surface is totally dry is if you're using a film negative um, and you put your film negative down on top of this and there's, there's still a little bit of solution that's wet or moist on there, that's going to ruin your film negative. So it's it's gone. And, you know, I print negatives that I made 20, 30 years ago. And when I'm doing that, I always make sure that my paper surface is totally dry. Now, um, something else that you can do when you're doing film negatives and I've, I've mentioned this for doing the other types of alternative processes is you go to an art supply store, you can go to Amazon and you can get some clear mylar film. And with the clear mylar film, what you'll do is cut a piece of it that'll fit over top of this. And um, when when it's on top of this, you put the negative on top of that then. So the negative actually never makes contact um, with the emulsion that you've coated on the paper. And, you know, with the digital negative, it doesn't matter so much because if you do mess a digital negative up by chance, then um, you can just throw it away and make another one. But with a film negative, you can't. For a long, a long time ago, when I was doing my undergraduate degree at Youngstown State, I did some work with uh, Professor Richard Mitchell um, of the photography department at Youngstown State of, at the Mahoning um, Valley Historical Society. And when I was at the Historical Society, we were printing some glass plate negatives as um, platinum palladium prints. And what I always did when I was printing those was I, I got some Mylar and I put a piece of Mylar down over top of the emulsion first before I put that um, historical negative down on top of this. Now, if you're putting it in a contact printing frame and you're using a glass negative, the other thing you need to do is you need to have a mat cut that's the, has the size opening of the um, glass plate so that you don't put too much pressure on that glass plate. And what I recommend actually is not even using a contact printing frame when you're printing glass plates, but... Um, you know, just laying a piece of heavy glass down on top of the um, mat and the, the glass negative inside of there. But the, you'd have that piece of acetate down underneath there so that, um, you're, so that you're not putting that glass plate or historical negative or your own personal negatives that are valuable to you on top of the actual emulsion. And then that will give you a, um, a good print and it'll also protect the negative, which is important. So I just wanted to show you this real quick also. This is uh, the latent image that um, after I exposed the, um, the, the image onto the, um, with my negative in the, in, in the ultraviolet light source, this is the uh, latent or ghost image that comes out with um, the classic palladium kit. So it's not a fully printed out um, kind of image like you would get with the Zia type kit, but it's an image though that you should be able to see an image. So if you take your piece of paper out um, and you can't see an image or it's maybe just totally black or something, then you've either given it too much light or, you know, something went wrong in the process because you should see a, um, a latent image like this. And then at that point, what we're going to do is we're going to um, go into the developer. But let me show you the, um, the uh, negative that I used on top of the piece of paper first here. So this is my 12 by 12 um, Pictorico um negative image that I created in the computer in Photoshop and then um, printed this out on the Pictorico film. And you'll notice that it looks like a little glazed over or something. And that again is because you're looking through the back or the acetate side 
um, of the negative. So the, the side of the negative that has the ink on it, um, the emulsion side of the negative is against the emulsion side of the print. So this prints just like when you're printing your negatives in the um, dark room. It's always emulsion to emulsion, even when like you're making contact sheets and so forth. So um, that's the way this will look. And I, I simply laid my negative down on top of there. I can move it around a little bit under the normal house lights, not under sunlight or ultraviolet light, but um, and laid this down. And then I would slip this into my contact printing frame. And then at that point, we're ready to expose it. And I believe I exposed this one... Um, I have it written on a piece of paper out there, but I believe this was exposed for seven minutes under the um, the ultraviolet LT LED light box that I, I made. Now, there's a directions on that, too, on one of my um, YouTube videos, so you can check that out. So, again, once I exposed it, this is the way the negative would look before I put it into the developer. So now I'm ready to develop the, um, the print that I have right here. So with the developing, um, you saw I put the, first of all, you saw I put the funnel um, into the um, bottle right there when I did that. And um, I always, I just have a funnel that I use for developers, um, for the palladium and platinum developers. I don't use it for anything else and I always rinse it out. But um, after I've developed the print, and I usually develop it about a minute and a half, so I will pour that solution um Pour the developer solution directly on the print the way that you saw that there, and we'll take a second look at it. But um, And then once I've, I've poured it on there and I've left the print in there for a minute and a half, I will pour that back into the bottle and cap the bottle back up to make sure I don't spill it. And um, it's um, it can last like a long time. It's especially the uh, potassium oxalate developer. I've used that for, you know, years. And what I do once every once in a while is I will um, actually get another funnel and um, put the the funnel in a clean bottle and put some cheesecloth in it and pour the, the, the used developer through that to get a lot of the old palladium salts or the platinum salts out of the solution. Because you'll see at a certain point it'll just be too dark and too murky looking, but... Um, you know, generally the, the the amount of developer that comes with the with a kit is plenty to develop all the solution that's in the kit. But um, you know, it'll it'll last indefinitely, so it's 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 good to have uh, you know all of them. So let's take one more look at the pouring action going over this print. And there you have it, a developed um, palladium print. And that print now will be ready to go into the, the clearing baths. So this is a, a picture of the pit, um, print inside the tray with uh, EDTA, the clearing bath. And I use, um, basically for all my prints, I will use two five-minute clearing baths. And I will do maybe about three or four prints through, the, through each clearing bath and then what I do is um, the first clearing bath will become ex expired first. So 
I will um, dump that clearing bath after I've done about four prints through it and I will take the second clearing bath and move that to the front of the line and make a fresh second clearing bath and um, the instructions for mixing the EDTA is um, you know again in the kit um, how much you need and stuff per liter of water but um, you'll mix it up and you'll put the first print or you'll put your print into the first tray of the EDTA and um, you're going to agitate it uh, and the time in there I use is five minutes and it's not constant agitation. You're just going to agitate it, um, you know, give the tray a couple whirls every um, 30 seconds or so just so that you're moving the solution around. And you can clear them, um, you know, upside down if you want to or, or top side up. I like to actually clear mine with the picture side down. Um, but, you know, just so that it's agitated somewhat throughout the five minutes. And then after the five minutes, again, I will use tongs and transfer this into the second clearing bath. And the idea of using two clearing baths is, um, is that the, the second one will, will be fresher because the, the amount of ferric oxalate that comes off of the um, platinum or palladium print during the, the fixing bath is, is greater in the first bath, in the first clearing bath. So that will become... Um, finished or spent more quickly and then putting a fresh clearing putting the print into a fresher clearing bath um, you know will actually help clear it out even more and but that'll be stronger so then you'll get a better clear now with this particular print and this will happen um, I think I mentioned this earlier in the video it, it'll happen that when you're using um, the um, potassium oxalate developer it, the, the ferric oxalate tends to hang around in the print. So I actually used a third bath on this, um, a third clearing bath. I So I cleared this print for 15 minutes rather than just 10 because I had this this yellow staining going on in here. And you'll be able to see in the finished print, um, when I show you the finished print, that the staining is gone. So, you know, after I've after I've cleared the prints, um, you know, again, making sure that the, the yellowing, of their highlights there was a little bit of yellow up in here too in this corner right here i i was able to see a little bit of yellow and i still see a little bit of yellow here and i think this was in the first clearing bath that i went into but again i did three i did three five minute baths of the edta um, to totally make sure that my highlights were clear and not yellow um, and if you have an old um, palladium print or something i actually bought a palladium print off of an artist and um when i when i got it um I could kind of see the stains were, were still yellow. So I actually went back and, and re-cleared it and it, it cleared out. And I'm not saying that'll work all the time, but, um, you know, if you do have a print that after it's dry, especially if it's a recently made print, you may try putting it back in a bath of EDTA and, um, that might clear it out or, um, try that other clearing agent that, uh, Bostic and Sullivan sells, which is, which I'm going to give a try just to have on hand in case I have a print that's troublesome in clearing, because you do want to make sure you clear all the ferric oxalate off of the print so that it doesn't, um, you know, contaminate the print later. And this is just a, um, picture of the print in the wash, um, so I'll wash this about 12 to 15 minutes, um, and I flip it around during the wash. But um, again, I'm using a Kodak tray siphon, if you can see it over here. And the Kodak tray siphon jets water out of this part, and it'll drain it out of the bottom. And these aren't made anymore, but again, you could find one of these on eBay. Um, they are a little bit pricey. I think the last one I looked at on eBay was around $50, but... Um, very well worth it if you don't have a fancy wash bath. Now, if you don't have that, the other way that you could do this, and this takes a little bit more time, but it's the it's the you can't just run water in the tray and let it overflow unless you maybe put the tray on an angle so that it would be draining out of the funnel part of the tray, the, the part of the tray that's pointy that's made to pour the chemicals out. You could kind of build a thing that's on an angle of board and maybe put the tray on that and run the water over on the left hand side and let it drain out of the right hand side. But the other way that you you can simply do it as if you're doing this um you know in a basement sink or something is just to keep filling the tray with water although it is kind of time consuming um, another thing you could do too is just get a tray specifically for your wash and um, you know run a little rubber hose down from the faucet to the um, and you can get those like shower kits that they they sell um, and run a little hose down to the left side of the tray um, and hook that up with a clamp or something and then drill a little hole 
over in the bottom of the tray on the right hand side then you would ruin a tray like that but you'd make it a wash tray and so the water would be going in on the left hand side and then draining out and you could even put maybe a little small block of wood under this to help it um, you know to help it drain and then you have to adjust your water accordingly but you want your water to be just about at 70 degrees in temperature and then again wash it for about 15 minutes at that point um, you can lay the print down on paper towels on the back side. I wouldn't put, put them against the front side of the print, um, but you could lay, the, lay some paper towels down on the back side, and then you can just simply put this down on a clean drying screen um, or hang this to dry on a clip. And I, I like to use a clip, but I also have a, a drying screen that I use. Now, one important um, thing about drying screens is, like, say you make one of these prints at school, or at another an open lab someplace where there's a lot of people working you don't really want to use their drying screens there um, you, the reason you don't want to use the drying screens um, at a public location is because I've seen this time and time again when I was um, you know teaching in the classroom down at the college and students um, especially notorious with uh, beginning students they would come out of the dark room with a print that's ready to go into the wash and they forget to wash it uh, momentarily and they might throw it right up on the drying screen and when they do that they contaminate the drying screen with fixer not only does the fixer drip down on the prints below um, and ruin those prints but um, the fixer will actually um, you know stay on the drying screen so then if you threw a really nice platinum or palladium print on top of that drying screen it becomes contaminated and what I do is I have a drying screen that I basically just use for non-silver prints. And then I have a drying screen that I use for um, uh, silver prints. And basically it's just, I went to a, like Lowe's and I bought some big window screens like you would use in a big window. And they're not that expensive and those work really great. You simply want to put them in the shower and hose them off every time with hot water between use and then let them air dry. I might take it outside and whirl it around a little bit to get the... Um, majority of uh, water out of it before I let it dry but it'll dry fairly fast and then I, I just suspend that um, I suspend that um, screen above an old bathtub and then I just simply toss the prints on after they've hung for a while because I do want to I don't just want to throw it on a drying screen either uh, because you are not squeegeeing these off like you would a fiber-based print. So that if I just put it on the drying screen right out of the wash, there would be a puddle of water and stuff that would form on it, and that would actually could leave a stain. So it, it might be best just to dry these for a little bit hanging up, and then if you wanted to make sure it was totally dry, like before you flattened it, you could lay it on a drying screen. But uh, make sure that the print is dry. And here's a picture of the final image that um, that I've created, a 12 by 12 palladium print. And I always um, show this to my critic to get a critique uh, blue. And um, she looked over this print and she said it looks pretty good. So um, this is a good one. This will go into the uh, box of prints that um, I will use for exhibition. So again, I will store this in like an archival method storage box. I could put interleaving tissue in between um, each print to make sure that um, it doesn't come in contact with any other print but um, it's it's good to go and it should last about 200 years if um, stored properly and don't forget to um, take care of those that help you out so uh, Blue doing such a fine job on the critique I made sure she got a snack for this so if you like the video please give me a thumbs up um, Please subscribe to my channel and um, there'll be more coming. I have another one coming on uh, Palladium too that'll help you out. Uh, thank you. Have a good day. Go out there and print some Palladium.